keynote speaker is Max, Max Schrems, really personal hero of mine for many, many years and also should be your hero, by the way, um, because he is really defending our privacy rights in, um, here in Europe in a big way. Um, had the guts to sue like Facebook two times and won two times against it. <laughs> yeah. Now, I think, Katrin, uh, it's worth having an introduction to present you. You are here today. Thank you for joining us. And you're also doing a keynote tomorrow. So thank you for that as well. Uh, Katrin is a technolo technology and climate researcher, a consultant as well, senior program manager at the Green Web Foundation, uh, which we'll hear much more about tomorrow. Uh, chair of Epicenter Works, Austrian, an Austrian digital rights organization doing, I would imagine, really amazing work. So thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> Co-founder and also co-led co Motif, uh, an institute for digital culture. Co-initiator of uh, Feminist Futures, doing important work there as well. And nominated for the Forbes 30 under 30 list, which is extremely prestigious. So thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. Daphne Muller is also here. Uh, we're lucky to be friends, which is great. And Daphne is part of the Nextcloud team as well, and we're very lucky to have her. Uh, as manager of alliances and eco, uh, ecosystem and support, she's doing amazing work with our team. So thank you, Daphne. Uh, you are also a researcher on the future of technology, its impacts on society and uh, the industry, the technology industry, with a special uh, focus on privacy. So, extremely important work as well. Um, you've had several publications in that area as well, which is really amazing. Um, also, Daphne is a speaker at TEDx. If you look up her talk, it is very enlightening, so I would definitely recommend you have a look there. It's about data privacy and platform capitalism and how those two collide. So, all of you, thank you for being here. <laughs> Now, I think I have a few rules. I think the rules would be no topic is off the books. But we all have our okay. <laughs> interests and also our expertise. But, you know, feel free to dive in wherever you'd like. The idea is to be less structured and more kind of weave our way through the conversation and ask the hard questions. <laughs> So if you want to speak, feel free to indicate to me or just go for it if it feels natural. And uh, I would encourage everyone on our instance, if you want to have some discussions there, maybe we said something interesting, please continue to have that chat on the Nextcloud instance for the conference. We'd encourage that. Now, I wanted to start with trust, transparency, and togetherness, which is our theme. And I wanted to use artificial intelligence kind of as a jumping off point, just to ask some hard questions, because I think artificial intelligence is an area where all of these questions are coming up. We're asking questions like environmental impact. Privacy clearly is an implication that we've been talking about. Um, but I think when I say trust, transparency, and together in that area, I'd Curious from the three of you, what immediately comes to mind, or to heart even? You know, what passionately just kind of comes up in you? So, Katrin, maybe we can start with you. Um, you mean about the keywords, trust, yeah. transparency, and together. Um, well, from an um, kind of climate view, transparency has become a really big topic um, with tech, particularly when we look at CO2 emissions of AI, for example, and how to report those. So this is a really big area that is still kind of under-researched um, and where I, th I see a lot of potential. That's coming to mind to transparency. However, I also um, 
observe that transparency definitely is not enough. Um, I would also encourage to, for example, ask questions around de democracy or equity in tech, that is just some other kind of perspectives that like transparency is a part of it, but it's not only transparency that's going to make um, technology more equitable. So I think when it comes to questions of trust, it's also... Um, basically thinking who trusts into technology, who can afford to trust into current technologies. Um, and we've seen in the history of technology, or specifically also if we look at AI, that there has been a lot of discrimination, a lot of um, favoring of certain people, and a lot of um, pushing away of um, marginalized people. So I think also when it comes to trust, I'm curious about asking trust um, into whom and from whom. And do you feel like that trust is a bit of a privilege, that it's not afforded to everyone? Definitely, yes. That's my question. <laughs> uh, any ideas on how we, what we can do about that, I guess? <laughs> well, that's where transparency obviously comes in, but also the question around accountability. So who is held accountable, for example, for data breaches, um, privacy violations, etc., and then also really looking into the bigger um, system. So you were talking about the US quite a lot. So if a democratic system is kind of falling apart, then obviously this is also a big issue. So um, that's been one of the themes that kind of reoccurred in my work um, throughout the last years was really to ask, I'm more coming from the digital human rights field. I worked a lot with netspolitik.org, for example, and really to ground these conversations also into bigger conversations around democracy and justice. Um, that's like part of my work and we can explore later sure. more. Max, trust, transparency together. Does that bring up any anger or maybe passion in you? <laughs> Um, I have to say sorry right away. I'm typing like my notes down on, a, on my phone so because I had that sometimes that so people are like, he's texting while he's on the stage. Uh, I'm not. Um, <laughs> Multitasking. So, yeah, I'm just remembering that's usually my biggest issue. Um, so tr for me, I'm taking very much like my privacy hat here, my lawyer's hat. I'm, I'm probably the wrong person for the big story sometimes. Um, but I think transparency always triggers me a lot in the sense of like that's kind of a... a a wishful solution to a lot of issues. Um, it's like put a bigger sticker on it. <laughs> um, and that's what we see at least in the privacy bubble is like the transparency usually boils down to just have a longer policy that says uh, we may do even more shitty stuff with your, with your data, but it doesn't really solve the problem. Uh, my favorite example is in, 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 it's kind of what the US calls notice and choice principles. There's a big notice and then your choice is take it or fuck off. Um, and my favorite example is in California, there's usually a law that you have to um, put anything that has cancerous material and it have a big sticker on it. Um, and there's even a sticker on Disneyland in, in California, apparently. Um, I took, <laughs> found a picture once. Um, but that doesn't really solve it. So transparency, I think, is a first step and interesting to see what's going on. But typically, only like real experts or people that really have the time are able to use, have the time to really go through that transparency and make use of it. Um, the bigger issue is how do we then solve it? So transparency for me is always a bit of a trigger word of like, mm, half solution potentially. Um, and I think trusting together, and as I would just say two things um, in combination, um, what's at least from a privacy perspective really interesting is we need to be able to share data with other people. So that is this trust part or also the togetherness part because there is oftentimes an answer, with, especially in the tech community, is how can we just you know, segregate it, wall it off, have a technical solution to it. And that partly is a, makes a lot of sense, but partly we also want to share with other people. We need to you know, have a contract somewhere or... you know. Um, inter interact act with other people, and that is usually in a developed society only possible if you have good trust. You can say, I can give you my most secret stuff, but I trust you, you're not going to do shitty stuff with it. And that's a, let's say, very like high level of, of, of solving issues, but that is probably what in the long run we want to have. Not easy and, and not simple, but we usually, for example, I mean, mostly trust banks that they don't run away with our money tomorrow, maybe in two months, um, but, but there's a certain level where our interaction only works on trust, and, and I think that is interesting how we can develop that further. And that can partly also be technical, that basically, for example, I can see proof of stuff actually happening in the way that they promise, because I have some code that shows that to me. That's the end of what I'm going to say on that. hope that's useful. <laughs> yeah, one of the challenges I have with trust is that, you know, we give a simplified example of trusting, you know, if I'm trying to have a conversation with you, well, we trust mm -hmm. each other, and that's okay, but... The reality is the trust, as you explored, was, goes through many, many, many entities. Yep. 
how do you trust the entire thing? Well, that's a challenge. Yeah, and I think, but however, we usually overca overcame that in, let's say, developed societies, largely. So I usually make an example is if I go in an ICE train back to Vienna, I do not trust that it runs on time if it's Deutsche Bahn, but I do trust that it doesn't derail instantly, and I have tr enough trust that some engineers somewhere in some room manage that without me ever checking it. And I think we do that in most stuff. Like, no one checked if this, if this place is built up to the building code, but we kind of trust it doesn't fall on our heads, even though there's a lot of concrete above us. Um, so we usually do have that trust in a lot of areas. I think in a tech bubble, we're, we have a, way, a long good way to go there, <laughs> partly. Um, but in most other areas of the law, we, we manage that trust. And there is, um, with new technology, that was always an issue. Like, if you look at the, the history of law, whenever a new technology came around, there was first distrust and, and also misuse and problems and things that didn't work at the beginning. But usually, the more that matures, the more the trust is building up gradually. And we have to say, with a lot of these discussions we're having, we're at the fucking beginning. Like, it's like Industrial Revolution 10 years in. And, you know, yeah, we had some workers' laws, but no one trusted them either. Now, 100 years later, we have some feeling that usually you get your paycheck in the end of the month. <laughs> and and that, that built up, and I think we have to be a bit, like, um, positive on that as well, even though we usually deal with all the shit that doesn't work. Um, but you have to remember, you know, where you are on that timeline that you're still at the very beginning. Right. <laughs> Any thoughts on trust, transparency, and togetherness? I think products developed by the computer science industry, most users will have absolutely no reason to trust most of them. <laughs> There's just no discussion about it. I was attracted to open source and Nextcloud because I was wondering what it would be like to be surrounded in an environment where people actually have values, because <laughs> that doesn't exist elsewhere. Well, it's not a given either. <laughs> No, so why should we trust it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Max, what do you think? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think maybe that's something that's unique in the open source communities that we exist in, is you have to build trust. Often, these are complete strangers that you're working with on things you're passionate about, and uh, it takes a while to build up that trust. And like, I have friends I've worked with for years that I don't even know their names, for instance. Yeah. And or that's surprisingly okay. Just to put it in, like, we have our, all our legal shit in the next cloud. And we had a discussion at the beginning, was like, can we trust that open source thing that no one of us has read every line either? And in reality, as a user, you just trust that some of you guys have checked on each other and it somehow works. P.S. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but <laughs> this is not a live bug report. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But um, but that is like largely what you do as a user as well. You trust that these are people that are well intentioned, that did the best that they could, and and if there is a mistake because it's open source, someone else would find out. That's exactly that trust model you have, and no one has checked that from our side either. Um, I mean, we do have a second wall around it, to be honest. But um, that is that is like the level where we felt okay, that that works for us. That's okay. But that's trust we have in, in, in your daily work as well, because if, if you guys would distrust each other, nothing of that would ever happen. So I think even in that bubble, there, there has to be all that trust in, in a way. Um. Hmm. <laughs> Deep. <laughs> yeah, it's important to take moments to really take it in, you know? Um, <clears throat> Katrin, I feel like you are, you've been writing notes, I see. So would you like to jump in? <laughs> No, I was just thinking it's a bit like infrastructure, no? Like once it doesn't work, you actually realize, oh damn, it doesn't yeah. work. So <laughs> it's like kind of invisible, but then when it breaks, like you trust into it, like you trust like a train system, for example, you kind of trust yeah. it. But then once it doesn't work, that's actually when we realize how important yeah. it is. And yeah. a lot of it is extremely cultural. I mean, I, I studied in the US twice, and, and part of it is that I love the U.S. to death. It's kind of my, to me, kind of the second place where I feel home. Um, but there is a very different culture in, in trusting, for example. And even within the U.S., I was first in, so in, in the south of, of Florida where everybody's Republican and everybody goes to church and everybody's Baptist. But in that bubble, they trust each other as well because that the fabric is then church and religion and so on. And, and while we usually have more trust in government, more trust in regulation, more trust in, okay, I can go in somewhere and it's not going to fall apart, that trust you don't have that much. A typical example is when I, you repair a car in the US, no one ever checked if that repair guy knows what they're doing. In, in Austria, they need to go through, I don't know, 100 certifications and five years of training to be able to do something on your car. But 
in the US, I needed all these different platforms to figure out, can I actually trust that guy to repair my car that it doesn't fall apart? Because there is no TÜV, there is no uh, any kind of like approval. Um, and transaction-wise, it, it's easier for me to just go to any place and know that the guy that's there actually knows what they're doing. Um, and I think that is interesting how we organize trust differently in societies, how we have that also in certain areas and other areas not. Um, and I think that, that probably plays out in a lot of that stuff in reality. And, and there are different reasons for, or different arguments for different ways of doing it, but parts of it, especially trust, is extremely cultural if you're in a society where you fundamentally distrust each other. Mm. The best yeah. example, we had an exchange student from Argentina. She was 18 and she wouldn't walk in Salzburg, the smallest town ever seen, for 15 minutes at night because she was always told she's going to be raped, molested, whatever at night. She was crying the first time she was at night out there because she learned you distrust society. You distrust anybody out on the street. That's the way you were brought up, which in Austria, you're like, oh, let's just do everything's going to be fine. <laughs> and I think that's extremely interesting how that's different per culture, per bubble, and so on. Now I shut up. Mm. Well, <laughs> well, I feel like often for us citizens of the internet, that's often the, take, the approach that we should be taking, which is distrust everyone until you, know, you have a few organizations that maybe you can trust, and they introduce you to other organizations or people that you can trust. So an interesting one. Yeah, I also wanted to bring it a big bit um, back to like the era of the climate crisis where a lot of these infrastructures, like particularly if we look at the internet and digital infrastructures, a lot of the times they're just, they've just become monocultures. I mean, I, I think this audience know what I'm talking about. So, um, for example, in certain environmental disasters, often um, these infrastructures fall apart. There's this great example from Hurricane Katarina, where like people did not have any access to internet anymore, except for this one small community of an open source um, internet network that was still able to be resilient in this time, and they were the only ones who still had internet access. So I think that's a really interesting example also to like kind of bring it back to times of crisis. Um, how can we also build these smaller open source alternatives that might be more resilient than these big um, tech alternatives um, to kind of also be more resilient and prepared for um, all the different disasters that we're facing. You really hit me with the word monoculture. I have some passions in you know, local farming and such, but it occurred to me just then when you said it that we can approach the internet and the tech industry with that idea of mono monoculture as well, because we're seeing that sort of playing out where you have you know, four, five, six very, very, very large monocultures of tech businesses. And Daphne, I know you have hmm, maybe some opinions on whether that's good for society. Uh, maybe there are some challenges there that we need to address, but mostly like, is innovation worth the societal cost in the particular model that we have currently? I'm breaking the microphone by touching it. Um, so the question was, does innovation, is that kind of balanced in the monoculture? Is that what you tried to ask? Yeah, monoculture, I think, at least, or prove me wrong, is a bit of a result of the capitalistic system and how it's been set up currently. And so the question becomes, well, should we keep going in that direction? No. And so where <laughs> should we be headed? We had a discussion not... <laughs> I was waiting for the one person saying yes right now. <laughs> um, we had a discussion, you and I, not so long ago about uh, Microsoft investments in open AI. And yeah, it's not really a surprise to me that they are doing that. Um, for example, I have a strange fascination to the acquisitions of Google um, because I figured out that Google, or in other terms, Alphabet, um, doesn't really do a lot of innovation on their own. So I was wondering what those 300,000 engineers are doing all day. Um, they bought most of their major successes, such as YouTube, Android. Um, they bought Quick Office, which is now Google Docs. They even bought their advertising technology, which they were earn all their money with, called DoubleClick. So if um, Google would have not acquired any other company, they would have not been much more than a search engine and a very good knockoff from Hotmail. 
So every time when my colleagues are worried about competition coming from big tech, I remind them that they are just a search engine with a knockoff from Hotmail, and that we also don't have to be too worried about Microsoft for the same reason, because uh, their investments in open AI are not a surprise given their business strategy. They actually bought Hotmail. Um, they also bought LinkedIn, GitHub, they bought Skype, which is now Microsoft Teams. Um, they buy a lot of different companies. They actually also buy PowerPoint. Did anyone know that? They didn't invent PowerPoint. <laughs> ah, collabora guy. <laughs> um, so it's not a surprise to me that uh, platform capitalism is functioning in this way. What about, I'm curious too about the environmental impact um, as a as it relates to this centralization, you know, you have all the information going to one place. Now we've explored the problems with that from a political point of view, but Katrin, I'm curious, from an environmental perspective, you know, can we do better with decentralized solutions? Is that a better option or are there solutions that you're exploring that we should th be thinking about? Yeah, so um, at the moment you can't generalize that um, decentralized solutions are definitely going to, like if we look at carbon emissions now specifically, that they're going to have less impact simply because we don't have the data on it. Like there has not been done enough research. Um, but if we like go back to the topic of AI, um, on the one side, it's really good that we have these AI technologies because they kind of help us understand the massiveness of the biodiversity crisis, of the environmental crisis. So like these models can definitely help us in understanding these crises. But at the same time, especially in the tech industry at Green Web Foundation, we work a lot with um, developers and technologists. A lot of people are just not aware um, how much of a carbon impact, for example, the internet has or AI has, so it's around 2 to 3% um, of global emissions are only from digital infrastructure, which basically means that it's bigger than the entire aviation industry. So it's a lot. <laughs> so and are you saying we should stop flying or that we should stop using AI? You know? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, can, I can't give you this um, advice really, but um, I, I also don't think it's always the best solution to base it on like individual users, you know, like these individual perspectives. We had it as well um, with plastic where you're like, if you don't take this one plastic bag at the supermarket, you're really going to contribute to, um, you know, making the world a better place while we have these massive fossil fuel companies that are just emitting, I don't know, if, so much more than like single people. I think we have to have both approaches. So it's not like individual versus the whole society or politics, but um, like it has to be in conversation basically. Um, but what um, we're definitely seeing is that there's a really growing interest into this topic on um, digital sustainability, but also that there's clearly a lack of data. So um, that's one of the big topics that we're trying to work on. For me, there's an interesting connection between what you say about AI potentially helping to understand the massiveness of these societal issues, um, while also the tendency that this exact solution will actually contribute to climate change in the first place. And I find that such an ironic um, train of thought because in many different industries, AI is supposed to be magic and help to solve societal problems. Well, actually, they are causing those same problems that they are solving or claiming to solve. They don't solve it. And I'm arguing way too often with climate researchers about, yeah, but AI will help to solve climate change. I say AI is causing climate change. Come on. <laughs> in the Netherlands, in 2019, the data centers were already using three times more electricity than the trains. <laughs> How is this going to help? Come on. <laughs> Well, I think part of the question there also becomes what's the greater societal value of each, the train system versus AI? And I think often with technology, we don't really know, right? You have a question. Uh, and so it's important to ask, you know, what might the near future hold with these technologies? Okay, we're fumbling a little bit because we're brand new at this whole AI thing-ish, sort of. 
uh, and we know we can do better, but obviously there's a lot of work to do. So, um, do you have a question? Uh, maybe I can. Well, actually, what you just said, it triggered something in me when you um, said the word decentralization. Well, actually, if you can uh, decentralize the energy supply, which is where we are on a good way to it, and if we have, like, decentralized AI, I mean, look at this here. I mean, if you connect these things together, then AI doesn't have to be a real uh, environmental problem in the end. Probably. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you. Um, we just don't have the data. That's... Um like it's an interesting thought and I agree with you. I just think we still need a lot more research in these areas. But definitely decentralization of energy is one. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm curious for each of you um, in your area of expertise, do you see awareness increasing? Like are more people who aren't necessarily nerds and technical folks in our audience, do you see generally that awareness of the problems is increasing and that the desire for solutions is also kind of seeing some momentum. If I may quickly add to what you just said before, um, I think what's really interesting is this um, responsibility shift in idea in the sense of like you're in charge of a plastic bag, it's not the plastic industry. And we have the same thing in the privacy bubble where it worked really well to say, oh, you are in charge of where your data is and you should like, you know, have your little bunker in your basement where you keep all your data and otherwise you don't have privacy anymore. Um, it's a, it's a re recurring theme by, by the industries to shift the responsibility from the ones that actually have power over something to the ones that actually don't. Um, and it's amazing to me because in Austria you still have to study Roman law from 2,000 years ago. And one of the principles ever since 2,000 years is if you have power over something, you also bear the responsibility of that shit. Um, so it's like if you write the code, you're responsible for what it does um, and not someone else that uses it. So um, I think that's, uh, that just connected to, to, to that question and uh, connects back to the awareness part. Um, and that's a bit kind of what I mentioned before about transparency. Um, we do see in the privacy bubble definitely more awareness. Like people do feel that something is weird and there is something going on. Um, my favorite example is we get that I think every two weeks we have some journalists saying, I have this case where someone was listened to in their conversation and blah, blah, blah. Are they all spying on our microphones? It's like, no, they're spying on everything around you so they can already predict what you said yesterday, um, which is even more creepy. Um, but there is, there is this feeling that something is wrong, but people will have a hard time to explain it and really know how it works in detail. And that gets back to the awareness part. I think we need general awareness. We need people generally agree that we need to move stuff. But that is different from detailed awareness. And I can tell you we work on Facebook for 10 years. I don't know the fuck how this is working in detail. And we even got like the raw data at some point. But I don't even think that Facebook engineers fully know how the system is working because they just do their little thing there. Um, so it's hard to just then basically, uh, on the awareness part, I think we need to stay on a very high level to make it comprehensible for people, to make it understandable, and not worry too much in the sense of people work for eight or 10 hours a day, go home, and are not gonna wanna worry about open source uh, um, environmental impact of, of their train trip, um, privacy, and you know uh, the other 20,000 things that exist. Um, and we need to kind of really decide that we are, are generally aware, but then do societal solutions to that with experts that know what they're doing in that area. I think that's how we ever overcame any kind of bigger issues. That's how we overcame, I don't know, electricity working. It's not like everybody understands how electric fittings works. It's just they understand there's a plug and it comes from somewhere and, and leave it at that. And if it sparkles, you probably don't touch it. And I think that's cool. And, and, and I think that's also how in all these other areas we need to, to get to her. I hope that's somehow useful. It sounds like you're <laughs> suggesting that abstraction done well is good for everyone. Yeah. Mm. And Daphne, uh, I mentioned, are you seeing extra awareness in the field of maybe um, the academic field? And are you seeing those ideas translated to everyday people who have extra awareness? Is there movement in helpful places or just kind of stale? It's kind of uh, fun to observe also a little bit from the outside now I'm working in industry because on the one hand critique on AI and privacy has always been there since I am studying the field 
where the industry is trying to emphasize on the narrative that AI is magic and it will become so intelligent that it will take over mankind. Uh, the academics say, well, we don't fall into that trap. Uh, maybe we should focus on the present day problems that are more concrete, like discrimination or climate change. Um, and they kind of argue that this narrative of AI will take over the world is taking the attention away from the real problems that are more likely to happen. Um, now, there are some developments in academics, but when I got interested in AI ethics for work, um, I called my favorite professor, Dene, he's sitting over there, um, and I uh, asked him, hey, yes, uh, what's going on with AI ethics? And conveniently, he just did a literature review on that. And uh, the first sentence was like, well, I'm sorry, this is hopeless. Um, all the frameworks are hopelessly high level. There are some toolkits, but they are behind the paywall. So the papers are basically advertising papers for a paywall tool. None of these methods are ever peer reviewed or tried in a follow-up study. Um, so they were pretty useless for me as a practitioner in the industry. And then we discussed quite lengthily why this was the case. And we think it's the case because academics seem scared of just becoming concrete about what is an acceptable application of AI and what is simply not an acceptable application of AI. They don't want to make up their minds. And that's possibly because many academics also believe in the narrative that limiting developments in AI is somehow dangerous because it would limit technological progress. And of course, if you limit technological progress, then you must certainly limit human progress, which is a connection that is not necessarily true. It sounds like there are some similarities in one definitely just mentioned with uh, Max, the sort of challenges you're seeing in law as well, where they said they wrote a thing, and yet it's, in some cases, not even there at all, or yeah. so broad that it's not useful. Yeah, I mean, I mean in law, it's, it's probably different per area. Um, we usually assume that people generally do follow the law. That doesn't mean that they always follow the law. And if you, if, unless you have an absolutist state, a total surveillance state, people will always not follow the law 100%. And that's fair. That's part of society. Um, and, and sometimes people overfollow the law. Like I was in Austria, you still had to do military service. So I opted out and I was an ambulance driver. I don't have much respect for red lights anymore when you go around the city. And, and then you realize, you know, people are in the middle of the night at an intersection where there's no traffic whatsoever. <laughs> they sit in their car in front of a red light and stop for no good reason, because nothing is around there, no one cares. Um, but we still have this inner feeling of that's a rule, we have to follow the, rule, the laws, and, and someone actually running a red light would probably die internally, even though there's no realistic reason. The other way around, um, you know, if it actually comes to following, I don't know, hundreds of other rules, people don't feel that that's that important, that's okay. Um, what's interesting in the privacy field, and especially in the, in the digital field, uh, field is that um, this Silicon Valley approach of, of move fast and break things um, just got so in intensive. And I was studying in California for half a year um, in, in Silicon Valley, actually, at a small university. And we were taught in school to kind of think about how likely is it that you're going to be caught? How likely is it that there's going to be a consequence? How much money can you make with that? That, that was simply the thinking. And, and it's economically making a lot of sense. But as a reaction, we need kind of much fiercer enforcement, which I'm not a fan of. I'm a fan of a, a government that, you know, doesn't look into everything and enforces everything a hundred times. Um, and that is a bit of a societal thing that we see is like the more aggressive industry becomes and the more they use every little hole and just go to the last edge and even go beyond if there is no consequence, the more kind of you have to push back and it, the more aggressive it gets and the more all of this kind of pushes up. And I think that's part of the Silicon Valley culture that we just now live in de facto globally um, that, that we have to deal with. So I, for example, when the GDPR came around, they said 20 million or 4% of the worldwide turnover as a penalty, which is billions partly. Where I was like, that's crazy. Like we never have penalties that are that high. Um, but it was necessary because in that culture, unless it has a billion, it, it's not even relevant. They don't even think about it. Um, and we see that even now in cases where we won. I mean, we had, I think, 1.8 billion or whatever against Meta, um, which, like, without 
us, when, like uh, sometimes comments like, how much do you have to donate Noib to get how much penalty for Meta? I think we, that would be an interesting calculation. Um, but even there, you see they litigated for another 10 years and they just to try to drag it out and so on. And that is, um, I think, an interesting development we're going to get into is that we're going to have this, if, if we don't morally agree on a core, if we don't comply with the rules because we think it's morally right, but we have absolute disagreement where they say that privacy is morally wrong and we think it's, it, it's right, it's going to be really, really hard to kind of work on that without really getting hyper-aggressive, which is de facto what we do at Noib. We are not, nothing else than being the aggressor in this, uh, but I'm not happy about that, that development that, that we see, but I don't think that there is much of a way around right now um, unless you know, we're going to mature in this area and we see that people will actually do ethical rights more and not just try to go as far as possible. I mm. hope that was somehow useful. <laughs> do either of you uh, maybe have uh, some thoughts to add to that? Just, um, I don't know if you know Logic Magazine. It's a really, really nice magazine on tech and society. And the latest issue was around how to move slow and heal things. I thought that was a really good kind of push into another direction, yeah. We once got a sticker saying, move fast and fix things. <laughs> and, um, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, you mentioned those fines in the billions. Do you s still think they're effective at all? Um, that's also interesting going back to do we have data on that? We don't. Um, so there's a lot of data on individual cr crime and individual people like blue collar crime, white collar crime. Why do people break the law, break in, uh, you know, molest other people? There's a lot of research on that. There's very little research on what companies do and how companies decide to break the law or not. Um, almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. um, so we tried to get that because we want to be as efficient as we could be to kind of, you know, do stuff like that. So we're now starting with that gradually to kind of ask DPOs what is actually, I mean, I, you have a lot of anecdotal research, so to say the DPOs, data protection officers tell you, I tell my boss for five years you can't do it, but the answer is we make 10 million euros with it, so why stop? if there is no consequence. So we, we start kind of going into that. What is interesting, we actually did a mass complaint system where we um, sent, I think, complaints to 500 different uh, websites for shitty cookie banners, basically. Because under the law, there should be a yes or no option, but they just do something else, as we all know. Um, so the thinking was, let's show everybody that actually if they would comply with the law, it would be a nice one. And because they have A, B, C, D, E, F, G testing for cookie banners, they like test them like fuck until they get more than 90% of a compliance rate. Um, we were like, let's do the same thing. So we sent four versions of emails to the companies to say, we're going to sue you. <laughs> and it was interesting to see like, you know, which versions work the best. And I think that's interesting A, B testing to go the other way around. <laughs> um, the result was the, was the most neutral one worked the best. Um, <laughs> but we hardly do that. We hardly know. Also, as the regulators, the, the, comp the, the authorities are actually there to enforce it. We have to think that just the privacy regulators in Europe, we pay 300 million euros per year to these regulators. 100 million of them, by the way, in Germany. So one third of all the money that goes into data protection is, is actually uh, sent in Germany. There's zero evidence on anything working there. Uh, the German DPAs don't even publish their decisions. We don't even know if they decide anything and what they decide. Um, even though they're also in charge of freedom of information at the same time, which is like mind blowing. <laughs> um, but we need to also ask how this is doable well how in the long run we can enforce against these big tech companies, what are the dynamics behind it, how are the decisions done in detail, um, to actually be efficient in now doing DMA, DSA, and the EU is going to come up with another 100 rules probably, and we cannot just pass more and more and more law, we also have to think on how do we actually get that on the phone or on the device of the individual person, and I think there is tons of research to be done, where with very little money and very little research we could probably be 10 times as efficient as we are right now. I think regulation is part of the answer, but for me it's also interesting to zoom even further out and wonder why uh, so many companies are up for violating the law in the first place or crossing such boundaries of human decency. Mm. So I uh, also am very curious about the values behind people studying computer science and the type of values and the type of mindset that we actually teach these kids. Mm. Um, and I think we are just pushing up the hype of computer science too much. I think we are teaching these kids as if they are going to be savers of the world by collecting more data and more AI. Um, and that is, uh, if I may add, uh, but I don't want to, um, what was really interesting to me when I was in, in the Silicon Valley uh, being there, and I was first, as I said, in Florida, super Republican, super conservative. 
but I was like, these guys at least had some values. There were values I absolutely disagree with, but there were values. Yeah. Sometimes in the Silicon Valley, I, I, there was this liberal do anything, but that's not necessarily a value. That's not just like laissez-faire, whatever. And I was interested because I, I had that feeling there partly. The other thing that is mind-blowing to me, and maybe you all know much more about that, but at least my colleagues in Austria that study engineering at the university did not get any courses into ethical stuff, um, also just the law. Crazy, right? It's, it's amazing because in any other area that you, I don't know if a friend of mine does social studies and basically, and not social studies, but like um, uh, social aid if like, you know, street workers and so on. They have half a year only of legal. What are you allowed as a street worker? What are you not allowed? Blah, 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 blah. And, and that is interesting because in, in that area, that's part of this maturing process we probably will have to have. We have that any doctor gets training on what are you allowed to do or not. And uh, at least the friends of mine, I mean, that's also a bit an older generation now, the only thing they were told is, yes, you have copyright in your code, make sure you have it. <laughs> that was kind of the legal education they got at the time. Definitely this will also mature, this will also change, but it's, it's, uh, it's the part that I mentioned before. If people have fundamentally different moral values or different views of what's right or wrong, it's very hard for the government to enforce that. Like we... Um, a good probably way of thinking about it, I, I was at the um, uh, German Data Protection Authorities Conference and they asked me to speak for an, uh, to kind of tell, give them an impulse on how can we enforce shit. Mm -hmm. And I actually had a slide of like a favela in, in Rio and that I visited way back when. It's basically an area where the government just gave up and just says, okay, let's just do whatever you want to do. It's super hard for democracy and, and governments to retake that ground. Like once you haven't fundamentally enforced your shit, it's really, really hard to get back into it. And that is partly what happened with the internet. I mean, that's, that was like the, the, the funny and crazy 90s. And I mean, I was still in that age that had an ISDN internet. So I had kind of an idea of, oh, that's suddenly you can get MP3s for free. That was funny and so on. But we're moving into an area where this becomes such a part of our society that we have to make sure that democratic rules are also enforced and, and get there. And that's extremely hard for, for governments generally to retake ground once the ground is... is, is used not to be regulated. Um, that's going to be an interesting time. <laughs> you mentioned government there quite a bit. I'm curious if each of you think that government regulation is the solution to these problems we've been mentioning, like the environment, such as societal impacts that we're mm. seeing for technology these days. Ooh. I think we have five minutes left. We do. <laughs> Pressure Should we on. take some questions? or? I think let's answer that one and uh, we'll see how long that takes. <laughs> okay. Because I promise that we don't do too long. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, it's a question um, back to democracy and um, also the raise, rise of authoritarianism across the world. Like, is government always the right model, um, there's a lot of countries in the world where you cannot trust your government at all. So I think that's just a really important perspective to take into account when we're talking about should government regulate more. Um, there is internet shutdowns happening, there is like um, a lot of um, facial recognition software developed, um, people can't cross borders, um, there's a lot of technology developed there, so I'm not sure if like, I think it's, like, from a very European perspective, this mm. idea of government and trust. Um, so I'm just a bit, um, like, trying to bring in the other perspective as well. Yeah. And also, I have to be transparent. I think Max and me are also both from Austria. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think the problems in the computer science industry are not that different in many ways from climate change. I think both are problems that are hard to understand and probably don't have only one solution direction, but require multiple. So I think government is one of the pieces of the puzzle. And my research focuses on um, the mindset around innovation and this conflict of innovation and regulating AI or privacy. One of my favorite examples is from uh, criminality prevention, this narrative that surveillance is necessary to protect us from terrorism. One of the um, AI software that's currently run in production in the US by American judges is North Point, and they help judges with knowing if someone will commit a crime again. And the accuracy rate of this AI is 61%, which is not much better than a coin flip. 
So theoretically, you could ask any animal, like monkeys, or my favorite one, the weasel, um, for a judgment, and you will get an equally good reply. Come on, 61%. I have seen horoscopes with a better accuracy, <laughs> right? So to break through the hype when we talk about AI within my team and at Nextcloud with Frank and Jos, for example, we started to replace the word AI with a weasel and then we asked ourselves if it was still a good idea or not. <laughs> and you have to remember, the weasels are racist, sexist, and they potentially also fart a lot because they emit a lot of <laughs> greenhouse gases and then you can judge if it's still a good idea. So is it a good idea to train weasels to generate a draft for a report nobody will read? Okay, fine. Is it a good idea to train weasels to blur your background while video calling? I have no issues. But is it a good idea to train weasels to judge if someone has to go to jail or not? I would say that's a bit problematic. <laughs> is it a good idea to train weasels to drive a heavy car through busy city streets? Of course not, someone is gonna die. So I think weasels should take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a question here, maybe I'll, I'll pass the microphone. Thank you. We only have a few more minutes, we'll try to squeeze in a few. Following the discussion, um, as my favorite sociologist, uh, Niklas Luhmann, once said, reduction of complexity creates sense. And um, I think usability is key, because if you look at the, how, how all the, I call them magma, because GAFAM uh, doesn't fit anymore. So how, how magma actually conquered the world is because they found easy solutions and uh, easy to use solutions for people so it's very, it's very simple. I mean, uh, people are buying an NSA spy and install them in their, at their homes because they say, hey, lights on and everything's happening. It's fine. So it's easy. It's convenient. So I think usability is key. I mean, if I want to use a solution like Nextcloud as a private person, first of all, a lot of in the tech community don't even know that it exists. I mean, I'm talking to a lot of developers and they don't really know that it exists. So it's a thing um, where like uh, marketing and sales and so on is a thing and it has to be Become a lot more public, I think, and it has to become easily usable. Like I want to have a click, one-click solution. No? I mean, I'm, I'm, I, have a, I have a business background, but uh, I never written a code in my life. But I'm still a fan. So, yeah. and um, I think this is the the most the most thing that, that you don't think about code or that you don't think about software, but that you think you have to have a solution for finding uh, for for solving problems. I think this is the the main key and. If we, if we provide an alternative where, where we can say, okay, um, here we have a solution which is equal to a solution like Gmail or like uh, the Google Suite or, or, or Microsoft in the corporate area, if you really provide a solution there which is compatible, and it actually is after what I found out today, then I think we really have a great chance to, to get an alternative because people who are minded, uh, I think two-thirds of the people are, mi are very minded about the privacy of the data after Snowden. And if we have a great alternative, and I think we have one here, we saw one today, and uh, so that uh, brings up some hope in me, actually. Great. Well, that's good news, isn't it? Quickly, please. Thank you. So many of these problems sound like it's because we are punishing data collectors on the other side. It's too cheap to collect all this data, why don't we do something that a small German uh, party wants to do, a political party? It's a digital dividend, so all those companies need to pay for the data that they're using and give the money to the people they collected the data on. Wouldn't that discourage them from actually collecting all that data? And you can't can do go mm. fast, break things, because you still need to pay <laughs> before you even broke anything. Yeah, I mean, to, to a certain extent, I think the taxation thing is interesting um, in, in different areas. I was just recently reading books like on, on how much like the systems are built that you're constantly hooked and you're constantly connected and so on. It would be interesting to say, okay, if the biggest uh, aim that you have is to have people be on your fucking phone for six or seven hours a day, which is not going to be good for any brain, 
um, why not tax that? You know, and, and we do have rules, and I think we have to be more creative about that. We had discussions about when, when Facebook and the kind of social media came along, is like the people didn't watch the news anymore. They weren't informed about stuff, that, that you know, news actually had to pay to get in, and, and so on. And we did regulate that in other areas. I can tell you that for private TV or for private radio, we, for example, required them that there is not more advertisement than, I think, six or seven minutes in Europe. There is a cap on advertisement. It's twice the, 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 uh, half the time than in the U.S., um, and we could do the same thing and say, okay, you can, in a news feed, you only every 10th thing can be an advertisement. You can pass that as a law. Same thing the other way around. We have laws where we say, okay, at every full hour, there has to be neutral news on any rate. If you want to have a radio license, even as a private company, you need to provide news. That's part of like getting a radio license. Why not say there has to be somewhat news in every 20th thing that is in a news feed? Um, so there, there, I, mean, I mean, obviously all of that is, gets a bit more complex because what's news, what's you know, conspiracy, blah, blah, blah. But um, there is a lot of these options that we could think about. Um, and it's interesting to me that this bubble managed to say, okay, we're above the law. You can't do it. it that would be against innovation. Um, and it's not against innovation to say cars shouldn't go 200 kilometers an hour in the city limits. That, <laughs> that's actually helpful. And I think there is much more, we need to open up our minds much more that this is doable. And, and if anywhere realistically in Europe, um, in the sense of there, we, we, we managed to pass laws like that, that we wouldn't be able to manage anywhere else, and we're large enough as a market that they kind of have to comply with it. And these two factors globally don't have that many other places. Um, so I think that would also be interesting and also inspire other countries or like other places that it's doable. With their variant of what they want to do, we don't have to like force privacy on everybody, but whatever they want to do, I think that, that would be interesting to think about. On, I'm not gonna talk, about it. I'm gonna answer the rest later. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I think since we're running up against time, I have one final question for each of you, maybe just a couple sentences. I, Given everything we've discussed today, what can those sitting here in the room today and those watching online, what can they begin to do to try to help in some of these areas? Catherine, do you want to start? Yeah, um, I would suggest, especially for developers and technologists, to check our developer site. I'm also going to... Um, show you some more tomorrow morning. Um, but there's quite a lot of cool open source tools. So I think that would, like, especially, especially for this community, be a really interesting start to get like a feeling on um, CO2 emissions of digital services. It's on greenwebfoundation.org slash tools. Um, what to do? Uh, like always have a bit of a hard thing because I'm usually this, we need to change stuff structurally, but especially for this bubble, like for example, what helped us is to point at alternatives. Typically, Nextcloud is one of the alternatives we can point to to say there is something else and to, get to, to, to take up what was there before is also the usability side of it. It has to be like as easy as something else, which I know like at least our developers hate in our office because we software and they love to do fancy stuff, but usually looks, looks ugly, but that is usually in our team even what gets people to use it. And I think once we can develop stuff like that where people can understand that it's easy in one line to, to see that there is an alternative, that can break down a lot of things in the long run. And, and I think you guys are one of the examples of, of how to do that. Well, thank you. Daphne? First, contribute to Nextcloud and check. <laughs> I have no business interest whatsoever. Um, and second, remember that more technological progress doesn't mean more progress for humanity if this requires the violation of human rights. I think we can agree with that. Uh, can we please say thank you to our panelists? Thank you.